Africa. Welcome to Daybreak Africa from the Voice of America. I'm James Butt in Washington. Today is Thursday, March 30th, and here are some of the stories we are covering. Vice President Harris stresses African innovation, good governance, and women's empowerment as the White House hosts a global summit for democracy. There's no question, right, when you have transparency in systems, when you have accountability in systems, when you create a system where rule of law is important, equal rights are defended and protected, you will see greater empowerment of all people, including women. Meanwhile, Vice President Harris has arrived in Tanzania on the second leg of a three-nation visit to Africa. We are also here from a Tanzanian organization on empowering young entrepreneurs that will be meeting with America's first woman and African-American vice president. The UNHCRO in Mozambique appeals for help in dealing with DRC refugees. Senegal's opposition vows to protest today, Thursday, despite government ban. The Constitution said that we can protest, we can demonstrate. It's in the Constitution. It's not normal that Makisal did not authorize and not accept any protest coming from the opposition. And authorities say the high rates of suicide among refugees in Uganda is worrying. Those stories and more are coming up on Daybreak Africa. On the eve of her meeting with Africa's only female head of state, and as the White House hosts a second-ever summit for democracy in Washington, D.C., Vice President Kamala Harris says putting women in power is a key ingredient for a healthy democracy. Viewers Anita Powell is traveling with the vice president and reports from Accra, Ghana. When Kamala Harris took the oath of office to become the most powerful woman in the United States, it was major news. In a vibrant and healthy democracy, she argues, women winning positions of power shouldn't be news at all. As she prepared to meet Thursday with Tanzanian President Samia Suluhu Hassan, she spoke to women entrepreneurs and leaders in Ghana's capital and announced more than $1 billion in private sector-led funding to advance women's economic participation in Africa. Afterward, in response to a question from BOA, she said women's leadership is fundamental to a healthy democracy and that it's a topic she often raises in high-level meetings. In every bilateral conversation I have with almost any world leader, that is a topic that we raise because we do believe it is in the best interest of prosperity and security for the globe. And she says it's not about pushing women into power. In a vibrant democracy, more citizens will feel empowered and more women will gravitate toward higher office. Uh, when it comes specifically to this continent and the correlation between that and, and women's empowerment, there's no question, right? When you have transparency in systems, when you have accountability in systems, when you create a system where rule of law is important, equal rights are defended and protected, you will see greater empowerment of all people, including women, especially if they have been behind or you see extreme disparities. So there's a correlation there, and we're going to continue to work on it, knowing that they're interconnected. That's one of the aims of the largely virtual summit in Washington which is co-hosted by Costa Rica, the Netherlands, South Korea, and Zambia. In Zambia, the Carter Center, the foundation of former U.S. President Jimmy Carter, will host a related event this week. David Carroll is the director of the democracy program there and told BOA that inclusivity is key. Healthy democracies are ones that are inclusive. They are ones that have transparency, that respect core fundamental freedoms and rights. And you know, hopefully they're also showing that they're able to deliver for their people in ways that really meet needs of their populations. And that's, uh, you know, another central element of, of the problem is democracies need to be respectful of core rights. They need to be inclusive uh, as possible. They need to ensure that broad respect, but they also need to deliver for their populations. If Harris's life is any indication, the road to power for women, even women in developed nations, is not without obstacles. When she was a little girl in California, Harris, who was black and South Asian, was part of the second class of students that were woven into what were previously whites-only schools. She went on to become San Francisco's district attorney, then California's attorney general, then onto the U.S. Senate, before Joe Biden tapped her as his running mate in the 2020 election, after she dropped out of the presidential race. As she travels across the African continent meeting with heads of state and encouraging women's participation in public life, the obvious question is... Will she be the American woman who shatters the ultimate glass ceiling? Anita Palvio in News, Accra.
U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris is in Tanzania, the second leg of a three-nation Africa visit that will also take her to Zambia. She concluded her visit to Ghana on Wednesday with a meeting with women entrepreneurs to discuss economic empowerment and leadership. Journalist Charles Kumbe in the Tanzanian capital, Dar es Salaam, tells me Tanzanians have high hopes and expectations about Vice President Harris's visit to their country. Many Tanzanians have a lot of expectations uh, from the vice president visit to Tanzania. Many areas that they believe that there, there will be changes is on agriculture, business, trade, and even on social services like health services. And also on issues such as uh, job opportunities. Uh, as you know that there are at least 266 American investment projects in Tanzania currently. And um, all these projects employed more than 50,000 Tanzanians. So with the visit of Ms. Kamara Harris, many should be expected uh, to come from her visit in Tanzania. Charles, how do Tanzanians see the relationship between their country and the United States? Well, currently under the leadership of uh, Samia Sulu Hassan, who came into power in 2021 uh, following the death of the late Johnny Magufuli, things have changed compared to what was happening uh, during the leadership of uh, Magufuli. Now the president, Sami Hassan, has made a move in making sure that uh, issues uh, regarding democracy, human rights, all issues are have priority at a hard administration. So there has been a lot of changes, maybe, uh, I can say, in issues such as in media. There are no such quarrels with the media as it used to be in the previous leadership. And also uh, opposition now are free to uh, participate in rallies and even the internal meeting are not intervened. So it's like now the relationship between uh, U.S. and Tanzania is going to be strong due to the current leadership under President Samia Hassan since because she's focused on democracy and even trying to change uh, from her predecessor's policy, which were against U.S., I can say. Charles, have Tanzanian officials released any itinerary in terms of uh, what the vice president is supposed to do while in Tanzania? Well, uh, yesterday the Minister of Foreign Affairs in Tanzania uh, said that uh, the Vice President uh, will be uh, in the country for three days. And the Minister also said that after she arrived, she will be welcomed by the President, her host, uh, President Samia Hassan, at the State House in Dar es Salaam, where she'll discuss various issues about the relations between the two countries. And also, on the same day, uh, the vice president will pay a visit to a memorial for victim of the 1998 U.S. embassy terrorist bombing. As you know that uh, the U.S. embassy by then uh, was bombed by al-Qaeda, which is in, in Dar es Salaam and killed dozens of people. And also, the vice president will also visit Tanzania Startup Association, which is an umbrella membership-based organization that brings together stakeholders of the startup ecosystem in the country. And also on the same day, Madam Harris will also have time to take part in an iftar dinner organized for her and other dignitaries by the president, uh, Samia Sulu Hassan. All right, Charles, thank you so much again for talking with us. Uh, we will keep in touch with you. Thank you so much, James, for having me. That was journalist Charles Kumbe speaking with us from the Tanzanian capital, Dar es Salaam. U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris will today, Thursday, meet with Tanzanian youth in the capital, Dar es Salaam, where she will be hosted by Sandbox Co-working Space, an organization focused on empowering young entrepreneurs, creatives, and innovators. For more on Harris's expected engagement, viewers Mike Hovey spoke to Zuwina Farah, co-founder and director of Sandbox Co-working Space. We're quite excited to host. Um, uh, one of the things is uh, I believe we haven't had a U.S. delegation in a very long time. We've seen her time in Ghana, and we're excited to have her here in Tanzania. Speaking of Ghana, throughout her whole time, she's yeah. preached youth, 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 youth. Yes. What is the reaction to that? How do you feel about that as a young African? It's refreshing to hear. 
Uh, one of the key things that we try to uh, advocate for is that Africa is such a young nation and uh, where the majority is the youth. And if we don't tap into that and upskill them or empower them, it will be very difficult for us to prosper as a continent. Uh, what do you guys have in store for the vice president? The vice president will be visiting a few entrepreneurs at uh, Sandbox Space. One of our members, the Tanzania Startup Association, will also be uh, hosting as well. Uh, we have a few startups, one of them being part of the uh, Sandbox community, one of them being part of a program that we run, which is Forward Accelerator. And uh, they will be showcasing their products to the vice president. But we also have a, a, a group of other startups that will be sharing their stories with the vice president. Now, speaking of that, once again, to go back to the fact that Vice President has been preaching about youth, she's also talked about how she's really excited to see the innovation that's on the continent. Uh, could you tell us a little more about that? You sound like you're talking a lot about entrepreneurship and tech. What do you think she should be watching out for in Africa? One thing that she should uh, look forward to is uh, the solutions or the products and services that are being um, innovated by uh, the youth or the entrepreneurs that uh, she'll be meeting. Uh, one key one is uh, on climate change, where we have young uh, innovator uh, that recycles laptop batteries to produce uh, lithium ion batteries that can be used whether to power up uh, lights or uh, shops, small shops and, and uh, in rural areas. He's at a stage where he's now deploying his first set of batteries. But on the other side as well, we have Niadiri Pl Platform, which is an online skill-based and uh, recruitment uh, platform, but it is also focused on tapping into the youth, uh, the 800,000 plus young Tanzanians that graduate every year and how to upskill them and prepare them for the workplace. Uh, uh, the third uh, entrepreneur that will be showcasing their product is Ramani. And uh, Ramani, I think, as of recently was on the news uh, where he raised about 32 million US dollars uh, in uh, funding. And uh, he is more on the supply chain and digitizing supply chain. Other set of entrepreneurs are more focused on health, uh, health tech, ed tech, uh, but also financial technology and uh, how those products and services can propagate financial inclusion in Tanzania, but in the region as a whole as well. That was Zuina Farah, the co-founder and director of Sandbox Co-working Space. She spoke to viewers Mike Hovey via Zoom from Dar es Salaam. <laughs> You are listening to Daybreak Africa on the Voice of America. I'm James Barty in Washington. Today is Thursday, March 30th. For more Africa news and features, visit our website at voaafrica.com. Connect with us on all social media platforms. We are on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Senegal's opposition has vowed to demonstrate today Thursday in support of leader Ousmane Sonko, who is due in court today for a hearing in a libel case brought by the country's tourism minister. The minister says Sonko falsely accused him of embezzling up to 60000 U.S. dollars. Mamadou Lamini Diallo is an opposition member of Senegal's parliament. He says the opposition has the right to demonstrate because it is guaranteed in the Senegalese constitution. Diallo also says the allegations are politically motivated by President Macky Sall's government to sideline Sonko, a possible presidential candidate in the February 2024 election. You see, the situation uh, in Senegal is uh, simple because if you look at closely what's happening, the judiciary problems of, let's say, Mr. Sonko, if you look at it closely, something really, I say, it's of kind of routine in a democracy because they are talking about defamation. Okay, but the problem become political when we see that all these years President Macky Sall used the judiciary system to condemn the opponents and make them ineligible for presidential election. And number two is that he himself knows very well that he should not be a candidate for a third term that is forbidden by the constitution. So the combination of the two things made the problem really political and of course and now it becomes violent but the government said that mr sonko has been accused of a crime tomorrow uh, process is not that trial tomorrow trial is sonko against the minister Nyan, and uh, that is about a uh, question of corruption
The crime you're talking about is about a young lady called Yajisar. She was accusing Sonko of rape. That one is not actually on the table. I mean, not for tomorrow, at least. So what is tomorrow's trial about? It's about corruption. Songo said that Mr. Nya, he's the actual minister of tourism. Songo accused him of corruption. He says that there was a report written by the minister of finance who indicates that the minister Nya was involved in the corruption of, let's say, $60 million, around $60 million. That's what Songo said. And then Mr. Nya went to court and he says that what Songo was saying was not true. That is the trial for tomorrow. But the government said it has banned all protests. Are you still going to protest? Yes, because it's illegal. The Constitution said that we can protest, we can demonstrate. It's in the Constitution. It's not normal that Macky Sall did not authorize and not accept any protest coming from the opposition. You mentioned President Macky Sall trying to run for another term, but the president has not said he's going to run. Well, uh, when we ask him, he says, what he say, ni oui, ni no, which is, uh, it's not non, it's not yes, for a thing which is clearly no. And what he have done uh, for the last two years is to prepare for the third term. And then uh, for us, it's quite clear that he's preparing the ground to run for the third term. But number two, which is more important, is that he used the judiciary system to eliminate candidates. And what people are seeing in these trials against Sonko is that he wants to eliminate Sonko for running for a presidential election. This is why uh, the opposition is mobilized against that. Thank you so much. A pleasure to speak with you. Okay, thank you very much. We keep in touch. Mamadou Lamini Diallo is an opposition member of Senegal's parliament. He was speaking with us from the Senegalese capital, Dakar. The representative of the UN Refugee Agency in Mozambique, Samuel Chakwera, says refugees fleeing war-torn parts of neighboring Congo are making an already complicated humanitarian crisis in northern Mozambique even worse. Charles Manguiro reports from Mozambique's capital, Maputo. The UN official told VOA in an exclusive interview on Wednesday that the agency now needs additional resources to cater to arriving asylum seekers on top of already settled refugees in Mozambique's own internally displaced persons. They are coming from the uh, Kivus, North and South Kivus, which is still uh, in conflict as we speak. So, so their situation is still uh, far from uh, the solutions. We have uh, others integrated. We have quite a few in Maputo, uh, in Beira, in Tete. Violent clashes between non-state armed groups and government forces periodically drive hundreds of thousands to flee their homes in the Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo or DRC. In February alone, according to aid agencies, nearly 300,000 people fled homes across the Rutsuru and Masisi territories in Congo's North Kivu province. Now, small numbers of these people have entered Mozambique's troubled northern regions where Islamist-linked insurgents are fighting with government troops in oil-rich Cabrilgado province. According to the UN official, Mozambique hosts close to 30,000 refugees and Islam seekers, of which around 9,000 reside in Maratade settlement camp in Nampula province, while the remaining 19,000 reside in urban areas with host families. The UN Refugee Agency says it works in full coordination with the Mozambican government, responding to life-saving needs and advancing protection and solutions for forcibly displaced persons. Chakwera said the increasing number of temporary refugees and Islam seekers from the DRC has strained Mozambique's resources. So we, we are appealing to more funding from uh, our donors to, to, pro, to provide uh, for for things like shelter is, is quite a, a thing, especially given the fact that we need resilient shelter because of the weather conditions. Um, so, so that's, that's the, the most you know, uh, big thing we, we are requesting the international community for support. As Mozambique's low-lying coast is prone to climate-induced disasters, the UN also provides emergency assistance in the wake of powerful cyclones that periodically ravage the region. A powerful cyclone, Freddy, struck Mozambique twice in February and in March, leaving behind a trail of damage, killing dozens of people and displacing 250 others in central and northern parts of Mozambique. 
for VOA News, Charles Manguero, Maputo, Mozambique. Rates of suicide among refugees in Ugandan settlements is worrying, according to authorities. A report by the UN Refugee Agency, UNHCR, says at least 60 refugees killed themselves across Uganda last year. The study cites several factors that are fueling the incidents, including family disagreements, domestic violence, substance abuse, the lack of basic needs, abandonment by a spouse, and community stigmatization. Catherine Nambi reports from Kampala. Most refugees fled violence and wars in their home countries, hoping to find safe haven in Uganda. However, the living conditions, poverty and failure to afford basic needs are forcing some refugees to consider suicide, while others have actually done so. Juma Dede, a refugee from South Sudan, says it has crossed his mind as well. I have nothing to offer to my kids. I have a kid who are in school who are some are in secondary level, some in primary level. If my child come and demand school fees, to me it looks uh, as though that child is insulting me because now I don't have something and the child demands money and my wife also demands money. Then I look myself, I said at least for these challenges I, I should kill myself out. The other factor that has been cited as fueling the suicides is sexual and gender-based violence. Nancy Amani, a refugee woman from South Sudan, says some prefer to die than continue being subjected to domestic abuse. Violence from the family, family members, actually the husband and wife, when the wife is seeing there is no any other alternative that she could do, she may turn up committing suicide. And if there is no way that she can see, no, nothing can help her anymore. That's when she can decide such a thing. Patrick Sambaga is the country director of Transcultural Psychosocial Organization, or TPO Uganda, which has been documenting some of the causes of suicide in the settlements. He says the worrying trend is the increasing growth of suicides among children of school-going age, which is blamed on substance abuse. In the environment that they find themselves in, nobody wakes up to become a refugee willingly. But they are now refugees, and uh, the dynamics of, of child bringing change. And uh, without much control, uh, we have children who are taking on substance abuse, the lifestyle. Rachel Chisache Tokahira is a mental health and psychosocial support supervisor at TPO Uganda. She has called for more investment in psychosocial programs for the refugees, especially the young ones and those in schools. We've registered a number of even children ending their lives. These behaviors are actually very evident. Children who self will do so, they will cut themselves, they will you'll find them with their rope trying to hang themselves. We've witnessed these things. So it's something we need to look into. Uh, maybe every uh, every school, if we can afford that, should have some counselors to support these children. According to a report by the UNHCR, other methods used in suicides among refugees last year also included poisoning and drug overdoses. The report further notes that the highest number of deaths by suicide occurred among male refugees who make up 67% of those who took their own lives. This is Catherine Nambi for VOA News in Kampala. The Liberian government has been indicted for human rights abuses such as extrajudicial killings, cruel punishment, life-threatening prison conditions, restrictions on freedom of expression, arbitrary arrests and detentions, money laundering, corruption, among others. The allegations are contained in the U.S. State Department 2022 Human Rights Report on Liberia, released on March 20th this year. Rita Gilabuduo spoke to Liberians for their reaction. I'm talking about obviously first this report from the U.S. Embassy did not come as a surprise to the Liberian people because this is something that we experience in our country on a daily basis. And we want to say thank you to the U.S. government for lifting this at such level and checkmating the government. It's happening. It is not something that we need to even say and argue about. It's happening. We are seeing it on a daily basis. Liberia is suffering. And sometimes you carry your own right to court in Liberia because you don't have money. They will step on a case. And we are grieving. You don't have money. Somebody lie on you right now. Like the person got money, you will go to jail, my sister. So that's why we are very careful because our right have been played with in Liberia. They have been a long time now. So we just decide not to just sit and just leave it with God. Only God can help Liberia right now. The reaction of some Liberians to the U.S. State Department 2022 Human Rights Report on Liberia.
A Liberian government official told VOA that the government will respond to the report after an interministerial meeting takes place. And that's it for this Thursday, March 30th edition of Daybreak Africa. I am James